Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, my name's Chris Calcutt, also sometimes known as Calc. And in this session, we're going to um, take a good look at circuit tracks. We're going to revisit circuit tracks. Actually, that's not fair to say. It's going to be circuit tracks and the original circuit as well, because um, tonight we're going to uh, delve deep into the, uh, the engine, the synthesizer engine that is included with both the original circuit and circuit tracks. Um, we're going to basically um, be working within the software front end for the, um, uh, for the synth editor, which is found in Novation Components software. Um, I've spoken a lot about Novation Components over the live streams, um, and this is, uh, this is really going to be very focused within Novation Components. Um, what that does is it gives you a full editor for the synth engines found within um, both circuits, circuit tracks and the original circuit. So um, I've got here my circuit track set up. Um, I've also got my launch key here as well. I'm going to use the launch key to input notes, play, play a bit on the keyboard as well. Of course, I can do it all on circuit or circuit tracks, no problem. I have my keyboard here, um, but it's just quite nice for me to have some black and white notes uh, to access and play. Um, and uh, yeah, and actually, if I just switch to this view, you can see kind of the way things are set up. Uh, in the room so um yeah so we'll we'll crack on we'll um, we'll open up uh, components but before i do i just uh, a quick point to know i'm connected to my computer here via the usb so um i've got usb connected directly to the computer and that allows basically components to be able to talk to the circuit tracks now there is another thing that you should probably be aware of and we'll do this now before we get into the uh, uh, uh yeah the meat uh, the meat of the of the synth editor editor um, that's actually just making sure that we're set up correctly for circuit tracks uh, to be able to work with the software in, in real time. And what does that mean? Well, basically, if I press shift and the save button above it is the screen printed setup. If I go into the setup page here, I'm given all these different switches at the bottom. Now, these are MIDI in, MIDI out, so that's whether I want to send MIDI notes in. So I've got my MIDI keyboard plugged in. I do want to be able to play MIDI notes as well. Um, but I've also got settings for my uh, uh, controller change messages. Um, and I need them all to be set to be listening and the program change as well, because um, when I'm working within components, we're sending this type of message directly to the hardware. And if indeed these are turned off here, um, by just pressing them, you'll turn them off. And um, basically, uh, that information, that controller change messages, won't actually go into um, go into circuit tracks, and therefore the communication between the software um, is not quite right. So I'm going to turn them on now. Um, these last two here, I don't actually need these turned on. These um, this is for clock, so this will um, uh, receive clock from an external source, or it will send clock to an external source. But they don't need to be on uh, in this instance anyway. OK, so if I just switch over to my uh, desktop here, I think this is the right button. Yep, here we go. So this is my desktop. And over here, you'll see I've got um, a little shortcut to components. So let's just double click on this and this will open up the software. And hopefully, yeah, you can see that now. Now, this is the front page of Novation Components, um, and basically, it's you can see it's a list of all of the different Novation devices that are actually managed and taken care of by Novation Components. Um, and, you know, we've got the launch key mini, launch keys, all the launch pads as well. And here in the middle, we've got circuit tracks. Of course, I'm connected to my circuit tracks. So let's just click on this, and this will open up. The, uh, the first page that we get to with, um, with Novation Components connected to Circuit. Now, this is actually a, um, a library page. We're not going to concentrate too much on this, um, but here you can see we've got some Novation packs here um, saved. I can log in as well um, to save and access my own packs, um, and these packs will be um, available um, uh, basically to me in the cloud as well. So. The really nice thing about uh, Novation Components is I'm running a standalone version here. I'm not using this on the internet, um, but if you have a web browser that supports Web MIDI, such as Chrome, which is the one that I generally use, um, basically you can also use this in a web browser to uh, yeah to basically you know do the same thing as we're doing with the uh, with the standalone version um, in this session. So, um, yeah, I mean, just a quick uh, quick note on the librarian here. We've got uh, one of the Novation packs, the Shadow Child pack, really great pack. And if I just click and expand this, you can see now I can go to my projects um, and I can access the projects. 
or if I just want to get some of the samples, um, sorry, look at the samples that we've got here, I can do that as well. Um, and if we then click on uh, show patches, now I'm ac I can access all of the different uh, preset patches that were available with that Shadow Child pack. And I can, you know, click on one of these and open it into the editor if I want and, you know, basically load that into the um, into the circuit. You know, I can use this as a really nice way to manage the different packs that I've got available. Now, up at the top here on components, you'll see we've got um, a number of different options. Um, let's yeah, let's have a quick look at updates. Updates basically uh, allows you to uh, go to update your um, your circuit tracks. Um, we've also got the MIDI templates page as well. And in here, I can create or grab one of the templates that are pre-existing. But I can create a MIDI template which allows me to essentially um, create my own mappings to um, yeah to eight presets that we have available. And these are great for controlling external synths. Um, and I can basically create um, yeah, a set of macro controls that will allow me to play and control the favorite parameters on my external synths if I want to. But for now, we're going to concentrate on the synth part. And yeah, this is really what we're going to look at um, uh, this evening. Now on this page, I've got a couple of options. I can upload a patch, I can grab a patch from Circuit Tracks, um, or I can create a patch. Now, um, we're gonna pretty much start from scratch here, and we're gonna explore what the synth engine is all about. So let's just open up uh, Create a Patch, and now this is taking me back to, um, if you ever kind of <laughs> see me demonstrate since a place that I often visit, and that's basically um, a standard raw sawtooth sound um, that, yeah, that is just basically giving me a sawtooth and nothing else. Um, but you can see here, I've got three main tabs for different aspects of the synthesizer's engine. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the synthesizer because it's a really powerful synth. And I think often this is kind of overlooked with circuit tracks. I mean, circuit tracks itself, of course, is made up of four uh, drum sample tracks, two MIDI sequencing tracks, which you can send MIDI out to external devices. Um, and yeah, basically, you know, use this as kind of a brain for controlling a hardware setup. Um, but we've also got two included, or uh, I should say, yeah, two built-in synthesizer engines. Now, the two synthesizer engines are actually exactly the same. They are essentially a kind of port from the Mini Nova synthesizer. Um, it's pretty much based on the original Nova synth engine. There are a few differences, um, which we'll kind of explore. Um, but really, you know, it's a it's a really powerful synth in its own right. It can sound absolutely fantastic. So yeah, let's switch back to components now. And as I say, we've we've kind of just created an initial patch. Now I can obviously give it a name here, so I can just click on it and just call this. We'll call this Calc One. There we go. Um, and we've given it a name, no problem. But let's just break it down into pretty much all the important parts. Now, as I mentioned, we've got our three tabs at the top here, but the, the most important one for building the sound, really, um, initially at the very least, is going to be this main page. Now, in this main page, we get access to pretty much most of the controls available to us in the synth engine. You can see it's quite, um, you know, there's quite a lot of stuff that we can control here. Now, um, yeah, let's start off with the oscillators. Now, the oscillators, of course, these are the things that are generating the sound. These are, you know, movements, um, moving kind of waves <laughs> that essentially uh, give us the building blocks for creating our patches. Um, and we've got two oscillators. So we've basically got two things generating the sound here. Um, and we can see them. We've got a really quite a nice graphic interface. Um, and you can see that we have a sawtooth. Now, at the minute, if we just look at the mixer page here, this is where we can blend and balance all of the different components in together. Um, so we've just got oscillator one turned on, oscillator two, noise, the ring mod, the pre effects and the post effects levels are all kind of just set to kind of default. So all we're listening to is literally just this sawtooth here. 
OK, brilliant. Now, if I want to change that fundamental building block, that, that waveform, I can just click this little down arrow here and you see immediately we've got a huge variety of different waveforms to choose from. We've got all our kind of classic analog shapes here. So sine, if we click on the sine now, you'll see it shifts over to a sine and we've got a very nice gentle your sine wave sound there, which is great. We go to triangle. We now can see, obviously, a little representation of the triangle shape. And again, a very kind of, um, kind of uh, nicely kind of paired back kind of waveform to work with. Um, the saw, and the saw, of course, is a really quite a harmonically rich kind of sound. Great for working the filter, you know, giving a lot of a lot of kind of a sound for the filter to bite into. And we can kind of um, explore the filter section uh, in a little while. And the next one I'll go to is the square wave here. And the square, of course, is lovely kind of familiar sort of sound there. But you'll notice as well that between the saw and the square wave, we've got a number of different kind of options here. Saw 9 to 1. PW, PW for pulse width. Now let's go to pulse width first. And pulse width is essentially um, a square wave. But what you can do with the square wave is you can change the point at which the square wave is shaped, the break point. Now, of course, if you're a fan of Sonic State, you'll know that uh, this is one of the thing that, things that Nick always reaches for, the pulse width see why I mean it can give a lot of really interesting kind of timbre to the uh, to the sound of course there um, and yeah you can also see in this nice little graphic interface kind of what's actually going on with the shape as well which is really uh, really useful okay now that's the pulse width which is basically a square wave but with a changing kind of um, uh, break point in the waveform but these ones are a little bit more interesting because these are kind of um, if you like a, a combination of sawtooth and square wave or pulse width um, uh, wave and it's essentially kind of a ratio here so we've got nine to one so it's nine, I guess let's say it's nine times more saw than it is a square. So obviously very square wave there, but as I move that, you can hear this kind of really sort of subtle change to the sawtooth. And if I go, let's say, go all the way down to now saw one, pulse width nine. You can see now that combination is quite drastically changed of sawtooth and, and pulse width. If we go somewhere in the middle, you might, yeah, let's go 5-5. Five, five. So those are our kind of classic waveforms that we can start with. Obviously, at the minute, we're just listening to the raw waveforms. We're not doing anything to them. Um, you know, we're just basically taking these little building blocks um, and just listening directly to those. Now, under the classic option, then we've got all the different wavetables. We've got a great collection of wavetables down here. So let's, why not? Let's just have a quick listen to the sign table. You can kind of hear the nice harmonics sort of building up in that sine wave there. Now the wavetable is basically a collection of different waveforms that have been kind of stitched together and you can then kind of scan through those waveforms and basically, uh, yeah, just kind of find the right point or even get a bit of movement in the waveform so that they're kind of, you know, they're giving a bit more character to it. And you've got a whole load to choose from. Um, I'll, let's, for example, I'll go to Digital Nasty, this one here. Kind of a nice kind of old organ sort of sound, but... So this control that I'm con uh, using here is the index control. And this is the index point of the waveform. So this is basically the control that will scan through the different waveforms that we've got available. Um, let's go for a different one. Let's go for digital vocal. You can kind of hear that nice kind of, well, what we call formanty sort of sound kind of mimicking a human sort of voice shape. Um, and so, yeah, so the index is allowing me to scroll or scrub through those waveforms and get to the different positions. Now, this is interconnected to the interpolate control here. Now, if I have interpolate on full, as it is at the minute, we move very smoothly between the waveforms that are stitched together in this wavetable. 
Now, if I bring the interpolate value all the way down here, it's now down to zero, there is no interpolation. There's no kind of nice smoothing action between moving through the waveforms. So uh, let's now change the index and have a listen to that. You can hear it's an immediate jump to that next waveform. So again, we've been presented with a lot of choices. And so far, all we're doing is just kind of listening to the individual waveforms themselves. So there we go. So basically, this is kind of the starting point for our sounds. Um, and, you know, we can really go to town, you know, obviously just go through all of these, experiment with them, play around with them and see, you know, see where it takes you. Um, I think for the moment, yeah, I'm going to go to a saw wave. I always like to work with from a saw wave to start with. Other waveforms are, of course, available, but that's what we'll start off with. Now, whilst we're still looking at this oscillator section, you'll see this next control here, the V-Sync. Now, that can have quite a profound effect to any waveform, really. But basically, this is using a thing called oscillator sync. Um, and basically, oscillator sync is a combination of two waveforms. And of course, you can see here in the shape, you know, we've got the, um, you know, we've got the shape of the sawtooth. And now if one of uh, if the if the other oscillator is running faster, so it's a higher pitch or running slower, so it's at a lower pitch. Um, what happens is when this the initial oscillator waveform resets, the other oscillator's waveform will reset as well. So that will start back at the beginning. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that essentially we're kind of forcing the second oscillator to restart before it's done its full wave shape. And that's basically oscillator sync. Now, what we've got here is a thing called V-Sync. We, we don't need to access uh, the second oscillator to be able to give a sync sound. We've got virtual oscillators in the background that are actually adding that sync sound to the waveform. So, um, yeah, so this can be really useful um, to get that kind of nice kind of, um, yeah, nice kind of gritty oscillator, oscillator sync sound for sure. And the other great thing is because it's a virtual sync, that means that I can have two oscillators um, independently oscillator syncing, if that makes sense. You know, we're not actually using a combination of these two oscillators to do it. We have the virtual sync in the background to do that for us. Right, now, let's move down to these uh, two controls here. These should be fairly self-explanatory, hopefully. We have semitones, so I'm just playing the note C here on the keyboard. And that's just changing the note that actually that is being produced when I press the note C. It's basically adjusting it by a semitone difference. But we also have the sense here, and a sense is a hundredth of a semitone. Now you hopefully can just hear that basically we've got a very, very fine tuning control with the sense. So a combination of semitones and sense can, you know, kind of help you if you're kind of trying to build up kind of uh, maybe using two oscillators to form a little kind of uh, kind of two note chord or something like that. You can you can use the uh, semitones and we'll look at the sense as well in a, in a little bit when we get a second oscillator in there as well, because that could be really nice for just thickening out sounds as well. Um, but also we've got a thing called density here. And what's going on here is we're basically adding additional waveforms on top of the original saw. We're kind of creating a type of super saw, I guess. So all of this is coming through from just a saw wave. But if I go and choose a different wave, again, let's go for, I don't know, let's try dry saw blend. We've got this uh, density control available there as well. Now, I would say I think that the the, uh, the density control probably, I mean, it, it, I, I would personally use it a lot more on the saw waves than the others, but it's there and you can use it on the others as well. Now, if I just increase the density, if we add more waves on top of each other, and then we can use the detune,
we're getting a really rich sound. And what's going on here is that we're, a bit, we're stacking these sawtooths on top of each other, but by using the detune control, we're actually just pushing the tuning ever so slightly out. So they're starting to beat against each other. Um, you can kind of hear that. You can hear that beating sound but also it really thickens it out, gives it a nice kind of chorusy sort of sound. Basically the detune is kind of a go-to when you're using the super song. Let's try it with a different waveform. Uh, let's, again, let's go for uh, kind of digital vocal. So this is uh, kind of giving quite a bit of change to the sound as well. Take the density out, of course the detune goes away because there's no additional waves to actually detune against. And this in conjunction with the indexing. You may need headphones for that No, let's just go up a... So, hopefully you can see that actually the oscillators um, and we're just listening to one single oscillator here. The oscillators themselves have got a lot of scope. There's a lot of power av available just directly in, in each of the oscillators. All right, let's go back to a sawtooth, of course. And now what we'll do is we'll just bring in the second oscillator. So I'm just going over to the mixer section here, and I'm just bringing in the volume of oscillator two. And you can hear now, I mean, it's pretty static there. We've got two waveforms stacked on, well, basic, two saw waves basically playing together, summing together, which is fine. Uh, but then maybe I wanna kind of make a, I don't know, let's go for a perfect fifth. So if I just play single note. So what's going on here is oscillator one is playing the true pitch. And then oscillator two is of course going up seven semitones, which is a perfect fifth. Let's go to seven. Yep, there we go. Now, if we bring that down to zero again, so they're now in unison, they're playing at the same note together, and now we'll just play around with the sense control on oscillator two. You can hear that same sort of sound. That same sort of thing as we had um, with the kind of the super source sound. So. Heck, why not? Let's go, let's add some density to that saw wave. And yep, we'll add some density to that saw wave. Let's do a bit of detune on both of them. Now, I've no idea because I've, I've not played any notes yet, but let's see what happens. Yep, that's sounding pretty good. Now, if I go to my circuit here and let's... Um, Ah, I'm going to just put the scales into chromatic mode. Uh, the reason I've done that is, of course, I'm playing the keys here, and that the scale me mode means it's, I'm not going to play all of the keys that I'm uh, I'm actually playing on the keyboard because we're filtering those out. But what I wanted to do was go to my effects page here, just add some reverb to that nice big. And of course, if I then maybe bring this down an octave, go on, let's go, let's, or maybe this might be a bit too much, but let's go down 12 semitones there. And now. Yep, that's a pretty big sound already. And all we're doing at this point is literally just playing around with the oscillators. We've not got to the filter yet or any type of modulation. Anyway, hopefully that's given you a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of an insight in terms of the real power that we've got with the uh, circuit uh, synth engine. Um, now, as I mentioned before, this is based on the on the Mini Nova, really. I mean, it, it's a kind of a porting of the Mini Nova engine over. There are quite a few differences, I guess. One of the biggest differences there is that the Mini Nova has uh, access to three oscillators um, per, yeah, per, per voice. Um, now, when I say voice, um, yeah, a little word on that. It's a six note polyphonic engine per each synth. So synth one has six notes that it can play at one time. Synth 2 has six notes that it can play at one time. Um, each one of those notes is really what I would call a voice. Um, and it's great, obviously, for chord stuff. You can play around with the polyphonic and mono settings, so you will actually only just be a mono, uh, mono synth if you want it to be. Um, but yeah, so we've got, you know, six notes that we can play at one time. And of course, we've got two oscillators per note. 
So I guess, you know, one synth is made up of 12 oscillators, I suppose. That's one way to think of it. Okay, so uh, let's have a look now at the mixer section. Now, we've, we've explored the oscillator, oscillator one and two. That's, that's easy enough. These are just basically volume controls there. So if I take them all down, we've got, whoop, let's see, bring that. My mouse is being a bit funny. We stop clicking on things. Okay, so they're both down, I'm playing the keys, nothing is coming out. If I go to the noise volume level, we've got white noise that we can add in to the signal as well. So if I bring up both the oscillators again, So that's just adding noise, of course, to that um, to the signal. Um, and that can be really useful. And you can just use the noise on its own. If you don't want kind of a pitched oscillator sound, you could just use the noise on its own, maybe for making hi-hat sounds or sort of maybe working with snare drum sounds, that sort of thing. It can be pretty useful for that. But let's bring down the oscillator one and oscillator two, and let's just have a listen to the ring mod now. Now, the ring mod is basically a sum and difference of the two oscillators, oscillator one and oscillator two, sum together and we're hearing the difference there. So if I start to play around with maybe the tuning a bit more, maybe it's quite an interesting sound. Let's change the waveform for the second oscillator. That's quite a kooky sound, a bit nasty. But you hear it's a totally different kind of sound and that is just coming from the ring modulator. If I bring in the other oscillators there. You can hear that the ring mod has got quite, um, quite an effect, really. And again, it's something to play around with. It might not be the sort of thing that you want to use all the time, but it's there and it's there whenever you want it. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so that's the mixer section here. We've got two controls here, pre-FX and post-FX. Now, these are levels for the synth patches. Um, before the effects and after the effects. So we can use this to kind of balance the sounds. Um, and especially if you're kind of working with them, um, you know, if you're building your own preset pack, you might need to just really kind of think a little bit about, I suppose, if you like, the mastering of the patches so that they're all sitting within that same kind of level. And the pre-effects and the post-effects will let you kind of just, just help you uh, kind of level those out. Right, now let's move on to this section, um, the filter. And the filter is really um, a moment where, uh, well, the, the place where you can kind of start to, well, as, as its name suggests, start to filter things out of the sound. So, um, yeah, now let's just have a listen here. So I'm just going to play a chord here on the saw waveform. And as I bring the filter down, you can hear that that filter, which is set to a low pass at the moment, it's going to let all the low frequencies pass through. If I open it all the way up to the top, we've got the high frequencies through. So this is basically um, the, the foundation, if you like, of, of subtractive synthesis. You know, we start off with some quite complex and and uh, harmonically rich, kind of full of body sort of sounds, and then we use the filter to kind of bring those back. And actually, when we get to the low end on a low pass, we should start to have a kind of a sine wave as the output. We're removing all that extra kind of harmonic content. So there's a cut at frequency cut off. That's kind of the, the key knob there. But we've also got the resonance as well. Now, if I just open up the resonance a little bit here, you can see in the graphic now that this represents the kind of the, the, the cutoff point. This Beyond here, we're not going to get any of the signal coming through. But just before the cutoff point, we can give it this bump called resonance. And the resonance there now will just give it a little kind of peak to the sound. At the point that it's being cut off. And that can add quite a lot of character to the sound of the filter. Now, if I bring up the resonance here, we've got this control here called Q. Now, a Q is going to basically narrow that peak or widen that peak. So essentially, um, where the resonance is kind of peaking at the cutoff point, it's peaking at kind of this kind of nice little bell curve here. But if I widen the Q, I'll widen that bell out. And if I tighten the Q, I'll really kind of bring that into a tight point. 
if we just listen to that let's just get to a more stronger point now it's really peaking and now it's widening so it's quite a subtle effect that one But yeah, it's just another way of being able to sort of control the behavior of the filter. Now under that, we've got key track and key track's quite an interesting one. If I go down reasonably kind of reasonably midway. <laughs> now, as I'm playing up the keyboard, the filter is actually opening up naturally with the, the key range. So as I move up the keyboard here this way, um, the filter is actually still is going to open up slightly as I travel up the keyboard. Um, and this is kind of a phenomenon that you would find with kind of acoustic instruments. The lower down you go, the kind of the, the sort of the, the filter is, is having more of an effect. So if I go down to the bottom and I go all the way to the top. There's actually a bit more of the harmonic stuff coming through there than it is there. And basically the key track is using the keyboard just to slightly control the opening and closing of the filter. Now if I take it all the way down, the filter stays exactly where it was. It's not moving with the keyboard. So the, you know, as I move up the octaves there, uh, the filter is just basically staying static. So key track can be quite useful, really, to um, again just to give the give that kind of flavour to the sound. Uh, next to it is quite an important one, and this kind of leads us neatly on to the next section. This is envelope two to the frequency. Now, if we move all the way down to the bottom left here, we can see our envelope shapes and circuits uh, synth engine um, is basically uh, blessed with three different envelopes that we can use. Envelope one is pretty much always attached to the amplifier. The amplifier being the volume control for the synth sound. And at the minute we've got quite a long sustain there. Um, and yeah, basically when I press a key, we're gonna get the note. When I take my finger off, it's gonna stop. But if I bring the sustain down, oh, let's see if I can grab it. There we go. I could of course use the, uh, the pot here to do that if I wanted. Now you can see this shape, which is now going to be applied to the amplifier, to the volume. And if I decrease the decay, actually let's just go up an octave or two so we can hear it. <laughs> it's pretty short there. Let's decrease that. So of course the decay here is pretty much controlling the amp. I've got an attack phase here as well, so I can add a bit of swell into that. And again, I can use those when I want. Now the sustain point is where the amplifier will rest once it's come out of the decay phase. So you can see I'm holding the notes down, it's sustaining. When I take my fingers off, the note stops. If I take that all the way down, once it's gone past the decay phase, there's going to be no volume. But if I have it all the way up, there is no decay phase now because there's nowhere for it to go. So I just bring that down a little bit to that kind of place. And finally, the release is going to give me a kind of a nice tail at the end, the amount of time it takes for the sound to actually dissipate, to go down to zero. That's quite a long release there. Hands free, still playing. Yeah, it's taking a bit too long for a live stream, so let's just bring that down a touch. So let's just try it now. You can kind of hear. We've got this nice release to the sound. Again, we can take that off, so basically we just stops immediately so these sorts of controls are great and this is basically shaping the amplifier now there is um, a control here for velocity now uh, the synth engine will react to velocity and at the minute it's not going to do anything to the velocity but if I increase that now the harder I hit in fact if I just go to this shot here and I'll use the pad If I put that on full, we get a, a more kind of uh, pronounced effect from it. 
So basically, this is now saying velocity is going to control the volume of the, yeah, the volume of the sound, the amplifier envelope. That's pretty useful. Now, what brought us to the envelope section was the envelope two into uh, the filter cutoff here. So let's go back to envelope one. Let's, uh, actually, that sounds not too bad. Yeah, that'll do. And if we go to envelope two here, now this is gonna be directly attached via this connection here to the filter. So if I just add some envelope two into the filter frequency, what will happen is it will follow the shape and it'll just bump the cutoff and bring it down to its sustain level after the attack and the decay place. And once again, if I want some nice attack to that, it's difficult for me to not do filter mouth as I'm kind of using this. And once again, I can use velocity to change the amount of filter envelope. Uh, uh, yeah, how that's affecting the filter. Go back to the, this shot here. The harder I hit, the harder the filter will open. So there we go, we've got three envelopes. Now the third one is a totally free form envelope that you can use when we get into the modulation section of the engine. You'll see how we can use that. But basically that's another shaper, another envelope shape that we can apply um, to wherever we want to, essentially in the, um, in the mod matrix. Okay, so those are the envelopes. Now I do wanna go back up to the filter. There's a couple of things that I need to just mention here. So um, let's, yeah, let's go for an initial patch again. Let's go create patch, back to the sawtooth, uh, back to an open filter. Great. So there we've got a low pass filter, 24 dBs per octave. For every octave of, of frequency change in the cutoff frequency, we'll lose 24 dB. So that's quite a strong filter. It's gonna take off a lot of volume as it moves down. Uh, but if we click on this little down arrow next to it, like the um, waveforms, we've got an option of different uh, uh, filters uh, to choose from. So if we go, for example, now low pass 12 dB, it's a much less aggressive filter. The volume change is much less drastic. So, um, yeah, so we can, you know, choose different filter types here. So we've got two different filters. We've got a band pass, and now we can see with the band pass, We've got this kind of little bell curve. If I just increase the resonance. And again, if I add some envelope to, uh, to that, and let's just put a little attack decay phase on that. That's a bit too much attack. Let's go bring that back. Let's bring in that second oscillator, detune it a little bit. Bit more resonance. And the band pass is 6 dB, so that's actually quite gentle in terms of how much uh, volume it removes, but we can go 12 dB. Can we hear that's a little bit more extreme. Now let's take the resonance down and we'll move now into high pass. So let's go high pass 12 dB. And you can see this is exactly the opposite of a low pass filter. It's letting just the high frequencies through. So we've got a choice of different filters. Oh, we've got a high pass 12 dB as well, a bit less aggressive. Now, if you're using 12 dBs, they're pretty useful for kind of big pad sounds and that sort of thing. If you're playing polyphonic notes, 12 dB filters are probably the way, yeah, they're probably the way that I would go with it myself. Uh, finally, for the filter section, we've got this little bypass switch here, and I can bypass the filter from oscillator one. So, now the filter is only affecting oscillator two. And if I wanted to, I could bypass oscillator one and two. Filters having no effect, but if I bring in the noise and the rig mod. The filter will still affect those. So that's a nice little kind of routing switch, really, that just helps you kind of decide what you want to send through the filter or not. OK. So, uh, yeah, drive type next, we've got a great sounding uh, drive. I'm just gonna go back to a single oscillator 
and let's whoop, play a nice chord. 12 dB per octave. And a bit of him. Yeah, and now the drive is basically a distortion that you can apply to the sound. And this is the diode type, but we've got a load of different types here. So, for example, we could go for a clipper, which is going to be a bit aggressive. He says. It's not too bad, maybe I'll just have a bit more feet. So basically kind of, yeah, adding a bit. If we go to the, um, uh, let's try a bit reducer, this should be. And then, yeah, it's got a rate reducer, sample rate reduction. Yep, there's plenty of scope for uh, for changing your sounds around with that as well. Um, so the drive type can just add a bit of grit, a bit of um, a bit of dirt to the signal too. Now, finally, we're going to come to the LFO section in this page. Um, but in order to use and demonstrate the LFO, I'm going to have to kind of LFO something. And um, we've got some what we call normal connections for, for example, the envelope here is envelope two is connected to the filter. Envelope one by default is connected to the amplifier as well. Um, but those are the two kind of ready made connections for you, what we call normal connections. Um, envelope three and the LFOs from an initialized patch are not actually connected to anything. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go over to the modulation page now into modulation and this section down here is my mod matrix mod matrix modulation matrix a little matrix a set of kind of apply something to something kind of uh, uh, kind of page and here I've got my different what we call sources and the sources are the different modulations available so we can have just direct meaning no kind of modulation just essentially an additional control for changing something and in fact if we have a listen if i just play a note and just change the control here that's basically yeah just changing the pitch it's a direct control it's a direct controller for changing the pitch but if i say actually let's get lfo plus and minus we're going to go to the pitch and then I add some an amount. You can now hear I have that amount of LFO1 controlling oscillator 1 and 2's pitch. Now let's go back to the main page and here we've got our LFO controls and this is set to LFO1. So if I change the rate, the speed, You can hear that that's having now an effect on the um, yeah basically on the uh, on the on the pitch, and again if I go to my different options here I can maybe go for a for a sawtooth LFO. Now it's quite an interesting thing if I play a single note, you can kind of see that shape. Now if I play another note, you can kind of hear they're out of sync. They're not playing the LFO together. It's a bit drastic, but anyway, that's kind of an effect that we want because what we've got is essentially an LFO for each voice. So every time I play a different key, that L a new LFO is going to be now interacting with the pitch. Um, we've got an LFO per voice. Um, and we can do some interesting things here. So if I go to my square wave, actually, yeah, let's make it sound a bit less like an ambulance. If I go to, I think, about 30, she gives an octave. Yeah. So this can be quite interesting to get some quite different kind of... Some different kind of approaches to using the LFO to kind of make the notes behave in different ways. I mean, they're behaving the same way, they're just being triggered at different times and therefore the LFO is, is triggering at different times. <laughs> Um, and also, if I wanted to, I've got a common sync here. So if I just switch common sync on, you can hear that interesting kind of thing going on. If I switch common sync on now, 
and now do that. You can hear now they're totally unified. They're going to move together. They're commonly synchronized. So regardless of how I, you know, start or trigger the note, that's going to uh, that's going to happen. Um, now we've also got one shot as well. It means an LFO is a is a constantly repeating form. But if we switch one shot on, it's just going to do it a single time. There we go. It's just done it the one time. Um, let's take that off again. Great. Now, let's go for slew. This is a good one to show with the uh, with the square wave because slew will round off the edges. We can also change the phase. Now, this will be better with one of the different options here. We've got so many different kind of LFO options and really quite interesting ones. For example, melodic here. Let's go for, yeah, let's go for a diminished. Now you can hear now that that's actually now changing the pitch in a stepped way. Now if I change the phase, it's basically the LFO is going to start at a different position. You can see it scroll along. We slew that as well. So there's a lot of stuff going on with this LFO and just explore the different shapes. I mean, we've even got kind of nice sort of sequence shapes in here as well. I'm just pressing a single note here on the keyboard. So there's a lot of scope with the LFO shapes. Now, a quick word on the section over here. So we've got the rate. This is obviously the speed. It's going a bit too fast there. It's going into the audio rates. A bit crazy. But then we have a sync control here as well. Now, when the sync button is turned on, it's going to follow the tempo of my circuit tracks or circuit. Let's go for we go to four beats. Now, if I um, just switch over to this and then go to the tempo, change the tempo, and of course the LFO is slowed down. So you can use that to great effect. Again, if you've got a common sync turned off, you can kind of start to use the LFO to actually start building ry uh, rhythms up. The delay option here, let's just go to uh, square again. If I put delay in and put the rate up, what it'll do now is it will give me a period before, well, in fact, it's set here. It's going to fade in. Let's just bring that. Before it reaches the full, in fact, let's just go to full. Single note, and now it's actually fading in that LFO into the signal. If I go to fade out, fade out the LFO. In fact, let's just take the delay off. <laughs> there we go. And um, yeah, and we can have the delay there doing different things. So we can gate it in. So we can just have straight note and then So you can use the delay in a number of different ways as well. Now, once again, we've got the we've got two of these LFOs here, um, and we can apply these to different things as we'll uh, start to see. In fact, let's go back to the modulation page because this is quite an important page for a lot of different things. Not only do we have modulation to control the different parameters of the synthesizer, um, in here we've got our velocity, um, so how hard we're striking the pads or indeed the keyboard. The keyboard itself, which is basically based on pitch, so lower down the keyboard will have less of a value, higher up the keyboard it will have more of an impact in the sound. We've got LFO positive, um, which means it's only going to go one way. LFO one and uh, positive and minus, which means it's going to go uh, above and below a center point in equal measure. And we've got the same there for LFO two and LFO uh, two. Uh, plus and plus and minus and then we've got our three envelopes as well the amp envelope the filter envelope and then the third kind of completely assignable modulation envelope 
We can apply two of these things at the same time. Um, so we've got two kind of identical uh, sections here. But then if I go over to the destination, you'll see now we've got quite a number of different places here that we can play with, including um, on here, we're calling it pitch uh, pulse width um, on, the, uh, on, on, this, on this page. But let's uh, just add some pulse width to the signal. And back to the main, we haven't got really a pulse width based waveform. We've just got a, a source. So let's go for... Uh, let's go this one. Now, if we go back to the modulation page, now we'll add... Oh, that's just doing it directly. You can hear we get to a certain point where... Oh, I think I've got a bit of oscillator 2 coming through. Let's just take that down. Try that there. Oh, no, of course, this is... This is the soar and pulse width uh, combination. But if I choose, in fact, let's just choose pulse width on its own. Let's go pulse width, here we go. And now we do that same thing. Gets to a point where the waveform is pushed beyond actually being able to make any energy and make any sound. So this is kind of like going through zero. Which is great, but I'm just doing it manually here with a depth. But if I go to direct, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, sources here, let's choose LFO2. Why not? We'll choose LFO2, add an amount. You can hear now how LFO2 on this page, LFO2. Oop, there we go. Is that right? Let's see. My mouse is being funny today. Oh, no, it is right. That's now having an effect. on the pulse width of uh, oscillator one. And then we could get adventurous here. So let's actually let's go back. We'll go to main, let's go to uh, oscillator two, and let's go for uh, let's go for a sore pulse width kind of hybrid again. And um, let's go to the modulation here. And now we'll take LFO1 plus minus. We'll apply that to oscillator 2's pulse width. And we'll go for a negative value there. And now, oh, let's bring in oscillator 2's. Now, there's quite a bit of movement there. Let's get a bit more depth on that, though. So let's go quite extreme with it. So quite a big sound. Again, just using the raw oscillators. There's not much going on with the filter there. Um, in fact, yeah, the filter's fully open. But we've got a lot of that nice movement in. And once again, if I start to tune a little bit, add some density, maybe. bit of drive to that as well. Pretty nice. Uh, let's get some envelope onto uh, on the filter as well. So bring the filter cut off down. So again, we can do a lot of stuff in here. Um, and yeah, we can use yeah use the different elements to control lots of different things. Oscillator levels, filter frequencies. We can add LFO, of course, to the filter. In fact, it'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? So let's just add LFO1 to the filter frequency. So <laughs> LFO1, of course, is set to a square. Let's go back and let's change that to... Of a triangle. And that's basically doing this now with the cutoff for us.
So, yeah, the modulation matrix is a really powerful thing. And now let's see, I think we've got 20 slots. Yeah, 20 slots of modulation matrix. I guess you could think of it a little bit like a modular synth here. I'm taking one source, taking a patch cable, and then plugging it into the destination that I want it to go to. Now, the next thing that we really need to talk about, and this is really quite important for basically creating any sort of patches with circuit, of course, it's fine me sitting here with the software and, you know, using the synth engine to be able to basically create the sound that I want. But if we look at circuit tracks, of course, here we go. I've got my eight pots at the top here, my eight macro controls. And this gives me proper hands-on control over the synthesizer, which allows me to basically, you know, start to manipulate and change the sounds. Now, let's just take a look at this. I'm going to, yeah, let's go back to um, an initialized patch again, and we'll start fairly, um, fairly basically. So, um, there we go, the old sawtooth again. And the filter here is, is set fully. So I'm going to just bring that down all the way. So we can't hear anything when I'm playing any notes. In the modulation matrix here, or uh, the modulation page, I should say, I've got access now to the eight different pots on circuit itself. So pot one is this one here, here. Pot two, of course, is this one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, one of the key differences really between the original circuit and circuit tracks is the fact that now these have been labeled. Now, these are only suggestions. These are not kind of written in stone. We just figured that it might be useful for people when they're building the patches to have some kind of labeling there, some kind of unification that means that, you know, if you want the filter, you kind of know where the filter is going to be. Now, if I just actually we'll just switch to this so you can see. Uh, pot number five here is labeled filter frequency. Um, I would probably say on a subtractive synth that uh, the filter frequency is the one that pre you're pretty much going to reach for let's say the majority of the time um anyway so let's go to pot number five here and let's just apply some um yeah some some control over the filter with it and this is where we get to this section here now macro five has the ability to have up to four individual things attached to it at the minute nothing is attached to it so as i play a note and then do this nothing is happening at all which I guess you would kind of expect because we've got no destination here. However, if I say, okay, let's go to our thing, and basically now I've got access to pretty much all of the fil all of the controls in the synth engine. And here we go, here's cutoff frequency. And cutoff frequency is now attached to, um, uh, to macro number five, but I've given it no depth at this point. So I'm gonna give this full, full depth. Now, as I move the filter frequency pot, I've now, of course, got my filter frequency attached to it via mo uh, mo macro number five in the uh, in this little section here. That's brilliant. Now, what I can do here, and we can get a bit clever with this, is I can say, okay, well, actually, I want the filter to just occupy that part of the macro control. So now when I get halfway, I'll have the filter fully open. And once I get beyond halfway, you can just see at the top here, it's having no effect. Okay, so why would I want to do that? Well, basically I can make a combination of up to four different controls um, in a single pot. So why don't I say, okay, well, let's take LFO one, let's take that to the filter frequency, there we go, and um, yeah, and basically now I'm going to say, okay, let's start from, let's see, where's that set to? Hopefully 64-ish, 63, yeah, actually let's go 63, and then from 64, we will apply an amount of mod matrix slot one, LFO one plus minus going to the filter cutoff frequency and we'll add a depth to it now. Okay, so let's see, I'm gonna turn the filter cutoff all the way down. We're just opening the filter, doing nothing else. And then when we get above the halfway point, see now we're starting to add just 
get a bit more depth in there. We start to add the LFO to that macro control. And this is how we can get some incredible power out of these macros. You know, we've got eight macros. We've got four, um, four distinct controls that we can apply to it. It might well be that you just want it to be, I don't know, for example, the amp envelope uh, decay or something like that. So you can just open it up a little bit when you're playing. But it might also be that you want to do, actually, let's take this down. I will move that down to, let's say, 96. Let's get this one starting at 97. And this time, um, we will go for LFO speed. Now, that should be in here. LFO one rate. There we go. And we'll just add a tiny little amount just to occupy this last section. So what we should find now is that with, the fil with, the, with pot number five all the way down, filter is closed. Well, let's play a decent chord. Let's go over this one. We open the filter. We get halfway. Now we start to add LFO to it. And when we get to 97, we start to increase the filter. Pretty neat. Lastly, what we'll do is let's go to this last one here. And I'm going to go to oscillator 2 volume. Have I got oscillator 2 up? No. <laughs> let's bring that up. Let's change the wave. Let's go for a square. There we go. And let's just open the filter a bit. Yeah, you can hear it's quite, it's a subtle difference there, but we've got the, the blend of the square and the saw. And in the final section here, let's, fact, let's just make that a bit shorter, that little section. And then, okay, 113, that's fine. And then now let's push that up to 114. OK, so we've now got four distinct areas on this single pot here. And I'm going to go for minus depth here. So what that's going to do is let's start off from the beginning of the pot here. So down and let's just play. Play the filters opening. Starts to add LFO to it. LFO will start to speed up. And then eventually we'll start to hopefully hear that the square wave will reboot. There we go. And we can populate all eight of these macros with these individual sort of settings. And it can be really, really nice and powerful. So, yeah, in fact, let's just very quickly do that. So here, um, pot number three is the amp envelope pot. So let's just go here. And I'm going to basically, let's go to the main and, yeah, let's take the sustain down a bit. Actually, you know what? No, we'll keep the sustain up. I'll go back to the modulation. And then here we're going to go to envelope one sustain. And let's take that first portion of the macro control up to, I don't know, let's say 48, there we go. And we're gonna take the depth down. So as this moves up, actually open up the filter. We take the sustain down, effectively killing the volume at this point. So now we've just got decay control once we get past that 48 point. Now, if I move this up to 49, and we'll go, okay, let's go to uh, no destination. Let's click on that. Yeah, my mouse is being a bit dicky tonight, but let's go for envelope decay, envelope one decay. And I'm just going to bring the depth down on that as well. So. so I've got this nice control now, which allows me to move between having a sustained sound to having a non-sustained sound. As I move from that back, and maybe I want to add a bit of release to that as well. So let's, um, will that work? Oh, I think it should do. Let's go envelope one release, and I'm going to add some depth to that rather than take it away. And we'll go, we'll go here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this will work actually. I've kind of got negative and positive values anyway, nothing like experimentation. <laughs> Yeah, it's 
just not doing anything. Oh no, it will if you do the short, sharp trick. So we've now got a pot that moves from being just an on-off, gated kind of it's on or it's off, to having kind of a short decay. Or if I now move to the release point here, there we go. Okay, so, I mean, that's a good look at the engine. That's a good look at the modulation matrix as well. Um, there's a lot of stuff, of course, you can do in here. This is kind of really where the brains of the circuit tracks kind of uh, performance side is, because, of course, when we're recording our sequences, we haven't even spoken about sequences on circuit tracks tonight, um, but that's fine because we're not talking about that. Um, but, of course, the sequences can have these pots um, automated as part of the sequence as well. So, you know, you can add a lot of expression, a lot of really useful um, stuff to the synth engine um, here up in the uh, modulation. Um, yeah, the modulation uh, macro controls, in the macro controls, sorry. Now, let's finally go to the effects. And in the effects section, we do have access to a couple of different things. Um, let's go back to an initialized patch. Let's go new patch, create patch. There we go. Um, let's add a bit of envelope to the filter. Again, really super basic sound we're starting with here, but it's fine. Um, it's really just to showcase what we've got going on here. So um, here I've got a chorus. And if I take the level down, of course, we have no chorus. Um, and in the chorus controls, I've got the rate. And we can slow that down. Nice kind of old analog polysynth style chorus. Just go into some crazy modes with the, with the rate, kind of sound effect style. Play around with the feedback and the depth. Just to make it a more pronounced sound. You can even sync the chorus. So it's in time with your tracks as well. And again, that will be affected by the tempo um, of your circuit uh, tracks or circuit, uh, circuit uh, original. Uh, we've also got a phaser as well, so if we put the phaser on. And again, we can play around with the feedback and the depth. And the delay. To get the sort of sound that we want. There we go. Uh, we'll take that off for now. We'll move over here. We've got an equalizer as well, which is really useful. I mean, this is per synth. So then increase gain. I can take the low part of the sound out by going minus or increase it and choose the frequency. It's quite um, a subtle uh, EQ, really. Same with the mids. I can. I'll set the gain up. You can hear it. Or again, I can cut the mid. So, you know, it's kind of um, a traditional EQ. It's not quite parametric because we don't have um, a resonance on there or Q. And I've got my filter closed, so the high gain isn't doing, uh, the high uh, filter uh, frequency isn't doing a great deal. But it's there anyway, and that's a really nice way of balancing your patches too. We've also got distortion, so hold on to your hats. Compression. And again, we've got different types of distortion available here. Now this is where the clipper is gonna get crazy, I think. I 
nice. And then, yeah, okay, here we go to rectify. We're kind of halving the uh, wave shape a bit there, a bit reduction. So there's a lot of scope for the different distortions in there as well. Um, and then uh, finally, we'll go to the voice mode here up at the top. And yeah, I've been kind of playing here on the keys. You've not been able to see it here. But um, yeah, at the minute, I'm just playing some chords that are loaded into the user chords here. But, you know. So we're in poly mode. And you can see it's set to poly mode here. If I switch to mono and play a chord, we're only going to get a single note out of that. Um, and... Yeah, that can be really useful, of course, for kind of creating sort of monophonic bass lines and that sort of thing. Just turn your circuit um, synth engine into a mono. Auto glide's interesting. So um, at the minute, I've got no portamento on, but if I turn portamento up, and if I play the notes separately, so if there's a bit of daylight between each note being played, the portamento won't have an effect. But if I hold and play legato, i.e. one note runs into the next, let's just add a bit more portamento to make it more pronounced. But if I play with daylight, there is no portamento. So that's the auto glide mode. If I take it back to mono, we're always going to get the portamento on there as well. And um, we've got a pre glide here as well. So I think this is just giving us a little moment, a sort of def defined moment. That's more portamento. I think it's just giving us a defined moment for the portamento. There we go. And the keyboard octave. This is probably the last thing that we need to talk about, I guess. But the keyboard octave is quite useful for when you're setting or saving your preset into the hardware, into the circuit tracks or circuits. Basically, this sets the octave of the note that is played when you're on your presets page. So if I go to presets here, you can hear Let's see if I can find some, maybe further down. Okay, so that's quite high up. That's if you can see it in components here. So this one, that's set an octave up. If I bring that down, let's bring it down there. Oh, I keep double tapping it. So let's just bring that down. So basically what's going on is that's setting the octave or the note that is played in the preset. So when we go to the presets and we kind of just audition them. We can choose which octave that note is going to be played. And it's quite useful really for the bass stuff. So, you, yeah, so basically that's what we've got there. Now, that's basically what we've kind of created, you know, but we've gone through all of the synth engine really available to us in uh, circuits um, and circuit tracks. It's a pretty powerful uh, synth engine. I hope you can kind of see that there's a lot of scope there. Um, I've not really kind of done much in terms of kind of kind of creating specific sort of sounds, but what I wanted to do is just give you a bit of an insight into, you know, what is available to you within this synth engine. It's a pretty powerful synth engine, all told. Um, and there's a lot of stuff we can do. Now, um, yeah, let's... I'm going to very quickly throw a patch together. It's just going to be a pretty basic patch again. Um, probably just, uh, yeah, slightly detuned saws, of course, always. Filter down a bit. Um, a bit of envelope to frequency. A bit of attack. Let's go up an octave or so. A bit of resonance on there. And let's go over to the effects again. We'll just add a bit of distortion. Maybe not that much. 
go to my modulation here um, on pot number five, which is the filter. I'm going to just get the cutoff frequency. So this is a very basic, you know, kind of patch once again. Um, <laughs> There we go. I mean, it's just for demonstration purposes, this one. I'm going to call this, again, just give it a name. So, again, we'll go Calc 1. Why not? There we go. Now, I've created it. So, what's the next thing? Maybe I want to send it over to my circuit track. So, I just hit here, send to circuit tracks. Oh, alternatively, I could just hit save here. I'm guessing it's going to prompt me to log in if I hit save. Um, ah, no, I can't save as... Um, all right, but I can download it to my computer. So if I was logged in, then I could save as, and it would just store it into the My Patches section over on the left-hand side. Um, but as it is, and I'm not logged in, um, I'm going to just hit Send to Circuit Tracks. Now it pops up with a kind of a little graphic that's showing me my um, all the different packs that I have on my circuit tracks. Um, and this is the one that I've got open. This one at the bottom bottom right here called Splice Sound. So if I click on that, and now it's just going to basically retrieve the patch data from this particular pack. And here is Random Decay. Now, I do know that these are all the uh, the stock pack, patch, patches, presets. So I'm going to just go over um, preset number one. Click Overwrite Patch. That's just sent it in now. And now if I go to... There it is. So if I go to a fresh project here, now my synth part. You'll see now that it's loaded in Calc 1. Now, this is something I've not shown you at this point, but this is really neat. If I press Synth 2 on the... Oh, let's go on to this one here. Yeah, if I press Synth 2, this button here, if you watch what happens to the, um, uh, the uh, editor in Components... It turns green and it loads in the pad or the patch that is on on um, yeah onto part on synth part two, um, and you can quite easily just alternate between these two, and that's really useful. I mean, I don't have to go through any kind of rigmarole to kind of load in a new patch and then send it over to synth two. All I simply need to do is just press synth one. I can look at the editor for synth one, synth two. I can look at the editor for Synth 2. Okay, I'm going to finish up now. We've been nearly an hour and 20 in, and, I, you know, we have kind of had uh, quite an in-depth look at the actual engine, you know, the, um, the synthesizer's engine, all the different constituent parts and how they all kind of put together. As I said at the beginning, this isn't really kind of an advanced synthesis sort of um, session. Um, you know, we did a little bit of sound design, but really it was just an, an exploration of this kind of, I often think, unsung synthesizer engine that is available in circuit tracks. And of course, you know, we have two of these, um, and this in combination with the four, uh, four drum tracks that we have, and of course the, uh, out, uh, the, the MIDI sequencing tracks, um, for connecting to external stuff. It does mean that the circuit tracks is a pretty powerful brain to a lot of things um, with the, uh, yeah, with um, uh, yeah, with its, with all of its, all of its features. So, uh, yeah. Now, I'm going to have a quick look over at some chat here just before I finish off. Um, so, yeah, excuse me one second. I'm sort of managing three different screens here, but let's just have a quick look to see if we've got anything on here. Um, any questions I might spot? There we go. Get the mouse over this side. Oh, wow. It's been pretty, pretty active out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of comments. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. I'll take a look through, and if I can see any things in the comments that... Um, that I think, you know, kind of really need to sort of uh, to address, then I'll, uh, yeah, I'll get in there and um, maybe leave some comments um, underneath in the, in, the, uh, in the comment section, of course. Um, anyway, so there we go. That was the first live stream of this year. I hope it's been of interest to you. Um, you know, as I say, it, it's not been a deep dive in terms of kind of creating different styles of patches and all that sort of thing. But what I wanted to do is really just explore all of the key features that we've got in this synth engine and kind of hopefully 
you know, um, hopefully show a few folks that, um, you know, there's actually a lot of scope in this, uh, in, in the synthesizers included with circuit tracks. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of places, a lot of areas to, to go to and have fun with. I mean, you can kind of tell that from the presets that, um, that arrive with uh, circuit tracks. It's a very broad variety of different types of presets. Uh, and of course, all of those presets have been created in this software um, before release of circuit tracks, which is 12 months ago, around about almost no, I was going to say to the day it's not. I think it was January and we're in February now. But uh, yeah, uh, just over 12 months ago. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Um, as I say, I hope it's been of interest to you. Um, we're going to be back in a couple of weeks. We're going to actually be looking at, um, I think if I remember correctly, we're going to be doing a little bit more um, kind of dip, dipping into the um, the launch key uh, the launch key mark threes and uh, kind of be kind of looking at some kind of interesting sort of use cases of that um, and uh, yeah and having a bit of fun with that but anyway for now I'm going to sign off but thanks very much for joining um, and uh, yeah hope to see you next time